we are now facing what some people call collapse. I mean, like, you know, Pablo Servigne and Raphael Steven, um, they've written stuff. They are now talking about collapse. And in fact, there is a new field now, collapsology. The nuclear weapons are, in a sense, the, the, the crowning point of things that started way, way, way back. For example, we could start at 1492 whereby you can see that you know if you if you have superiority in weapons you can pretty much do what whatever you want i mean that's what led to you know to the genocide of native people wherever native people live not just simply in the us but also in africa in any part of the uh, of the planet and so that particular uh, process in 1492 that if I have the weapons, if I have most, I'm more powerful, then basically my power can be exercised with impunity. And to this day, in a sense, that is really what is operating in any situation. I mean, I was just going over, you know, the, the UN Convention Against Genocide, for example. It's only, in, uh, well, a couple of days ago that Germany seems to be saying that it is going to recognize the genocide that you know, the Germans did in Southwest Africa, you know, against the Herero and the Namaka people. But, but still, even though there is that kind of indication that there might, it might lead to then an apology, we, we are not there. We are not there at all. On a daily basis, individually, people do something and then they immediately, if they're strong, that people say, sorry. But when are you dealing with nation states? At the end of uh, President Obama's uh, uh, presidency, he went to Hiroshima. And I thought that, you know, there was a golden opportunity there to apologize, but it didn't happen. And it didn't happen, um, well, for all kinds of reasons. But, you know, I once visited the, the museum the, in Las Vegas about uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And what struck me about the, the, the video that it showed, the, it, it was only the physical destructions buildings and things like that. And so when I started reading uh, a book by, you know, the Japanese writer, Suji Ibuze, Black Rain. I mean, Black Rain is absolutely phenomenal because it details, it's, it's fiction, it, you know, it's presented as fiction, but it details incredibly, you know, what happened to people. What is, and of course, then what, what struck me about that book is the fact that, you know, if you go back to, um, uh, slavery, or what I would call industrialized enslavement, I mean, we don't have that kind of details. We don't have the details about how people were kidnapped from their houses and brought to the ships and then, you know, put on those ships. We have here and there bits of, you know, stories, but we don't have that kind of details. And because we don't have that kind of details, you know, in a way, can be sort of ignored, so to speak. Because speaking of details, when you read Primo Levi about describing, you know, what happened in the concentration camps, there are things there that make you realize that, you know, this has been, you know, really something. The same thing happens with uh, Sholokov um, when he writes the Kolima tales. I mean, the same thing, you know, in the Soviet Union. So in order to understand suffering, I suppose, you know, one has to know the details of what it inflicted. And that particular issue is not really embedded in U.S. society from what I can, I can see, because if such a thing had ever happened here, I mean, you know, there have been incidents here and there, but, you know, nothing, nothing comparable to Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, where people you know, don't know what they're suffering from and in incredible pains and, you know, suffering and not knowing what really happened. I think Jackie Cabasso once used the word insanity. I mean, it, and it is insane. I mean, how can you have a situation where just simply a few countries can decide that, no, we are going to have the weapons and we are going to decide how we can use these weapons or when we can use and so on and so forth. I mean, you know, leading to what we all know about, you know, mutual, uh, mad, I mean, mutual accepted de destruction. So I started reading Gunterland. And so I ended up reading more recently uh, two of the three volumes translated in French. And the title 
of the, these three volumes, L'Obsolescence des Hommes, or The Obsolescence of Humans, basically. And Gunther Anders says, you cannot separate the Holocaust, you cannot separate the concentration camps from what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because what you see there side by side is the acceptance by humans that the industrialization of death is acceptable. And once you, and this is Gunther Anders arguing, once you enter into that kind of mindset, you are really headed for extinction, basically. I mean, he doesn't use the word extinction, he used the word, uses the word, the word obsolete. Um, and he was way ahead of his time, in my view. So more recently, I came across Norbert Wiener, admittedly the, the, the founder of uh, cybernetics. What I didn't know was that when he saw what happened with the atomic bombs, he basically became a militant against the use of atomic uh, weapons. And he is the one who used the, the same words, in fact, as Gunther Anders, that, you know, humans have become machines. I mean, in fact, Norbert Wiener, you know, was, he was a mathematician and a philosopher at MIT, and he played an important role in, in the development of computers. But his view was that we cannot compare the brain, the human brain, to a computer. And, and this is a very important issue because, I mean, if you, if you look at the way things are going, you know, the algorithm and, and all of these things that are being used, you know, by Google and all of these people, I mean, the emphasis is on the fact that the, the, the human brain uh, is like a computer. And Norbert Wiener insisted, no, th th this is absolutely not the case for all kinds of reasons. And in that sense, just like Gunther Anders, he was way ahead of his time. And one would wish, you know, people to, to read actually on and around people like uh, Gunther Anders, uh, people like uh, Norbert Wiener. Uh, I got this biography of his, I mean, written by a, an Italian, actually recently. And then he has this book that he, Norbert Wiener, wrote, The Human Use of Human Beings. And when you read that, he points out in a sense how in this process of mechanization of humans, humans are actually being enslaved. And in a way, if one looks at the dominant system today, did slavery ever stop? Yes, it was abolished, right? But, you know, it's still part of the DNA of this dominant system. I mean, the same with the genocide, the same with fascism, with colonization. When I read people trying to talk about post-coloniality, I mean, <laughs> it never disappeared. Just look at the continent, the African continent. I mean, all these heads of state are just basically trying to behave as if they were still, you know, in the colonial era and do the same. In other words, to, to make a long story short, I'm still learning, I mean, and trying to understand how would one move away from this dysfunctional world? My, my sense is that we, we, are, we, we don't know what we are up against. Yes, Marx said many things, understood many things. No, but Wiener is, is very, very open about what he's up against. And of course, you know, immediately the FBI went against him as you know, a communist and so on and so forth. But, you know, he said, you know, as a scientist, I'm not going to work to promote warfare. So, is it possible to abolish warfare, to say, if there is a disagreement, if there is a contradiction, resolve it by just simply talking with no use of weapons, no use of uh, violence? Is that possible? My sense is that, why not? I mean, after all, if we assume that humans are not machines, then we should be able to actually say, yes, it's possible to resolve issues, differences, without resorting to violence, right? The one thing that, that I've learned a little bit you know, by reading this reader, mindsets are the hardest thing to change. In the so-called Annal School of France, you know, there, there was a guy whose specialty was studying the people's psychology, uh, psychologies, you know, mindsets, Mondrou. And what one, one, one can see there is how difficult, you know, changing mindsets can be. Because mindset is something that people sort of hold on to as if, if I let go of this, I'm lost. 
or I'm gone, or I'm dead. So once we have that kind of situation, and of course, that is at the core of, of you know, fascism, Nazism, you know, any form of the authoritarian thing. And the, the tragedy is, I ask myself, can we really say that democracy is possible under capitalism? In my view, that's not possible. Well, what I like about the question is that it, it forces one to think backward and forward, right? It, this is something the Native Americans, at least some of the, the, the young you know, historians are saying, you know, their history is a future. What is interesting about the COVID is that the COVID has shown that there are no borders. And of course, I mean, now what we see, you know, in Mozambique, in Burkina Faso, West Africa, what we see, we see terrorists at work. Are you going to use nuclear weapons against terrorists? How? 